It's the day terrorism came to Australia. Every page in the room went off and I got the news that Russell Street had been bombed. A car packed with explosives brings death and destruction to Victoria's police HQ. If I could put my hand basically into my leg and touch my bone, I thought I'm in a little bit of trouble here. Investigative reporter Adam Shand rebuilds the case against the bombers. He said, if I ever have cancer, put a suicide vest on me and wheel me into the bloody joint. And uncovers new information on the dark motivations to reign terror on the streets of Melbourne. This is really evil, really evil. I mean, how can you do this to human beings? This is not Australia. It was lunchtime on Thursday, March 27th, 1986, the day before the Easter weekend. Here in Russell Street, Melbourne, at police headquarters and the city courts, people went about their business as they would on any other day. But someone had other ideas for that day. Someone who wanted to bring terror to our city streets. 750. 750, I presume you heard that loud explosion right next to you. Russell 750, it totally shattered our windows. We have an explosion outside this building. Melbourne now resembled a war zone. It was one o'clock and the first of a series of car bomb blasts were rocking the centre of Melbourne. Someone had packed a stolen car with explosives, parked it outside the police centre in Russell Street and unleashed hell. There was no warning call. In the chaos of acrid smoke and shattered debris, at least 19 people lay injured, three of them seriously. Where were you exactly, do you recall? Uh, yeah, I'd come out of the courts um, and I, I'd only been at Russell Street for a week at that stage. Rookie cop Carl Donadio had been on duty at the magistrate's court opposite the police centre. So I started walking from the middle across, obviously no cars coming. And then all of a sudden I found myself thrown up the road 20 odd metres and landed flat in the back in the middle of the street. There's been a second explosion unit, stay away. What was your initial reaction? Thought I'd been hit by a car in that first couple of split seconds. As soon as I stood up, I could put my hand basically into my leg and touch my bone. I thought, I'm in a little bit of trouble here. Carl had been hit by flying shrapnel from the blast. We raced across the road and I just put my arm around him and helped him get to the stairs. There was certainly one policewoman I remember. She grabbed me and then they laid me down in the steps of the uh, north door. Any number of uh, people who were very, very lucky not to be killed Louis Fountain was in his office, got up from his chair, walked somewhere and a shard of glass came through and speared through the back of his chair. If he'd been sitting in the chair, it would have gone straight through him. Look, it, it was so sudden and the noise was something I'd never encountered before. Sandra Gibson, was driving down Russell Street on her way to a meeting. She drove straight into the path of the bomb. My car started kangaroo hopping around the road, the bonnet flew up and the glass flew out of the windscreen. And then I became aware that it was happening to other cars. I saw glass um, being blown out of the doors. Uh, there were cars moving around the road irregularly. It was like being in a war zone. So my first thing that I became aware of was someone coming across my car, like someone somersaulted over my car. And it was clearly someone in uniform, and I believed it to be a woman. 
because of the hand. And that was Angela Taylor? I believe so, yeah. Constable Angela Taylor was on a lunch run. She had taken the full brunt of the blast as she crossed Russell Street. The first person to reach her was criminal lawyer Bernie Barmer. I was in court number one in front of Magistrate Brian Clothier um, and the place erupted and all this dust and blackness came out of the ceiling. I turned around and I couldn't have got out the door because if everyone was packed at the door. So I went over the bench clerk's uh, desk and I went around and um, out the front and uh, regrettably ran into a beautiful young girl who was on fire. <laughs> 21-year-old Angela had only recently graduated as ducks of her police squad. What did you do? Well, I put her out. Um, How did you do that? With my hands. Um, her clothes were sort of blown off. And, um, police women's hats got this uh, white plastic or whatever it is. I mean, that's all burnt into art. Um, so I took her and, you know, there was just skin and um, she was badly, badly injured. This is really evil, really evil. I mean, how can, how can you do this to human beings? This is not Australia. It's disturbing that we've got cowardly people who could only be described as curs that are prepared to impose this sort of violence on the community with little regard for life or property. It was evident that the police were the primary target of the attack. However, the bomber was unconcerned if civilians got in the way. Remarkably, no one died on the day, but Constable Angela Taylor was in a critical condition fighting for her life. Next, the hunt begins. What did you have to go on at that stage? Initially, very little. And more tragedy for police. Wiley had a shotgun. As he entered the room, Reed fired and shot Mark Wiley in the upper body. In Tulsa. The bombs were lethal. First, a massive car bomb at one o'clock, followed by four others, apparently timed to cause maximum injury. This was more like a scene from Beirut than lunchtime Melbourne on the eve of Good Friday. The unthinkable had happened. It does open up, a, I think, a new and terrifying dimension in violence. We've never had anything like this before in this state. We've, we've read about and seen uh, car bomb incidents in other parts of the world. I don't think we ever thought we'd see it here. When a car bomb exploded outside the Russell Street Police headquarters in 1986, injuring more than 20 people, Victoria Police was quick to establish a task force. No less than 29 detectives were assigned to the case. One of their first tasks was to sift through the carnage left in the wake of the explosion. What did you have to go on at that stage? Initially, very little. With the help of Australian Defence Force experts, Detective Chris O'Connor focused on the bomb. The actual device was very, a very fundamental, basic explosive device. 
114 sticks of gel ignite in the boot and front seat of the bomb car had been connected to an alarm clock set to go off just after 1 p.m. in the busy lunchtime rush. This material is used for blasting tunnels, so you, you can appreciate the, the power. And not all of the gelignite had detonated. There's possibly about eight to ten um, sticks that were blown clear. Half had been exploded, some hadn't been exploded at all. It was a tragedy, but it could have been a far greater terrorist act had these people known what they were doing. This was a deliberate, outright, attempt to murder as many people as possible. Army Major Kevin Cuffordson was among the first to realise the bombers had messed up. They misunderstood the type of detonator that they were working with. And that subsequently only fired part of the charge. Major Cuthbertson demonstrated to 60 Minutes how the blast would have looked if the bombers had managed to detonate the complete charge. He filled an identical car with the full bomb load. Countdown, five, four, three, two, one, fire. Wow. feel the pressure wave even at this distance. We felt it, yeah. You imagine that trapped inside buildings. That was just extraordinary. This is a crime which surpasses all others and the government wants to respond. We want this person, these persons, whichever the case may be, identified and brought to justice. The Russell Street bombers needed to be caught, and fast. Luckily, the forensic team soon had a lead. The bomb car was parked at the police compound alongside a vehicle that was used in a arm robbery. It was discovered that the bomb car shared something in common with this other car. The vehicle that was used in the bombing, the radiator support panel had, the, had identification numbers on it, which had been drilled out, physically drilled out. Now, the identifying numbers on the arm robbery vehicle had also been drilled out. Members of the stolen car squad recognised the technique. And essentially, this was something of a unique MO uh, that was used to uh, rebirth vehicles, stolen vehicles. Peter Reid was suspect for um, this type of behaviour. What were his antecedents at that point? He's a car thief, a car converter. As it turned out, police already had Peter Reid under surveillance. They decided to bring him in for questioning. The detectives said they smashed their way into the house, confronting Reid in the bedroom. They described how he was crouched on the bed with a double-handed grip on a 45 caliber revolver. It was pointed at them. The police operation was led by Mark Wiley from the armed robbery squad. Wiley had a shotgun with him. As he entered the room, Reed fired and shot Mark Wiley in the upper body, in the torso. He fell back into the arms of other police who, who moved him from the scene and uh, Reed was uh, felled and uh, he was put out of action. 
Mark Wiley eventually recovered from his wounds and rejoined the police. Reed was taken into custody. I didn't do it! I didn't do it! I didn't do it! It would be up to the courts to decide what Reed did or didn't do. But he did lead police to what would prove to be a crucial address. Harros Avenue, Nanawadi. What we call the bomb headquarters. That's where the bomb was put together. That's where the bomb car was stored for a period of time, as well as uh, other vehicles that were, were associated with um, robberies connected to them. Remember, this was 1986, before the advent of DNA. The forensics team had closely studied the alarm clock, which triggered the blast. But now they took a particular interest in a wooden offcut from a red gum tree, which the alarm clock was attached to. This is some of the key evidence. This is the piece of wood that the actual bomb device was set up on. A similar type of... Detective like Inspector this. Bernie Rankin worked with Detective O'Connor and the ADF to establish a link from the red gum offcut in the bomb car to Harros Avenue. That red gum offcut, in fact, was an offcut from a red gum post for the fence at the back of um, Harros Avenue. Both pieces of wood were milled by the same saw blade. It was a bodgy cut, so at the bottom of the offcut and the top of the post had these matching um, oddities. The forensic case was coming together. The next question, who lived in the bomb house? The uh, people that lived or rented was, was a fellow named Zelenka. Carl Zelenka and his then girlfriend. He was uh, somewhat of an associate of Craig Minogue. And Craig Minogue, not long before the bombing, moved in there. Craig Minogue was well known to police as a violent armed robber who didn't like police. That made him a suspect in the Russell Street bombing. Minogue and his brother Rodney who also lived in Harros Avenue, had made themselves scarce since the day of the attack. But they were not the only ones police wanted to talk to. They became very interested in the identity of a regular visitor to the Harros Avenue house. Zelenka had seen an older gentleman come there to visit Craig Minogue. Yes. And he knew this person as Stan the Man. That's all he knew. Next, on the trail of Stan the Man. He was a terrifying person, Stan. He'd spent three to four years in hate division. Here's the bloke who blew up Russell Street. Following the Russell Street bombing, many of the injured police officers were sent for treatment at the Royal Melbourne Hospital in Parkville. Constable Angela Taylor was clinging to life. She'd suffered burns to most of her body. The news was better for 19-year-old Carl Donadio, who was able to sit up in a wheelchair and show off his scars for the cameras. A lung was punctured and there's been a successful operation through the stomach to remove shrapnel lodged between the kidneys. His recovery is amazing and Carl is looking forward to returning to work. And I was just unlucky to be there. So, I mean, if you have a negative attitude, then your body just won't heal as quick. I was out within a month. Um, then I was on light duties for three months at the district office in Carlton back in those days. So, I was, yeah, I was pretty lucky that I was determined to get back into it. Meanwhile, the investigation was rapidly progressing. A house in Harros Avenue, Nunawading, had been identified as Bomb HQ. Police were on the hunt for the Minogue brothers, but they were also looking for a regular visitor to the house, Stan the Man, who was revealed to be Stanley Brian Taylor. Now, Taylor was no spring chicken. 
He had a criminal record stretching right back to the 1940s. He was an armed robber, essentially, and uh, he was one of the one of the more prolific armed robbers in in the town at the time. He'd spent much of his adult life in prison, and a large amount of that in the infamous H Division at Pentridge. He was a terrifying person, Stan. He'd spent three to four years in Hates Division, and if you had seen anyone who'd come up from Hates Division, there's something about them. Ray Mooney served time with Stan Taylor in Pentridge in the 70s. Taylor was a violent career criminal, but when Mooney started an amateur theatre group in the notorious prison, he saw potential in Taylor. Stan was an excellent actor, an excellent, and I take credit for that because I was the first person ever to cast him in anything and got him involved in that whole acting world and he then goes on to write plays. Now, A Stretch of the Imagination is a one-man show that Jack Hibbard wrote, which was one of the biggest plays ever by, in Australia. It was a one and a quarter hour performance where Stan plays A Stretch of the Imagination. Jack Hibbard comes in and sees it. Every actor, in Australia, all the top actors in Australia would play. He said, that is by far the most outstanding performance that I've ever seen anyone do it. They're Jack Hibbard's words. That's how good Stan was. He was as good an actor as anyone could ever be. Taylor was able to put those acting skills to work after his release from prison in 1978. He managed to convince the federal government to hire him as a mentor to troubled youth. It was in this guise that he met the Minogue brothers. We spoke with Mrs Minogue, who was your ordinary, everyday mum, and she gave us a bit of information about this um, boys had been to the Commonwealth Youth Supports game in Murrelbark and that uh, Stan Taylor had been the youth worker come mentor with that scheme. And that's how the boys met Stan. Uh, the, uh, the irony of it all, that is that here's Stan supposedly guiding these boys to positive adulthood and he's actually teaching them how to be armed robbers. How many armed robberies did they do? Various members of the group, inc including Stan and Craig, were charged with upwards of 20 violent armed robberies that we knew about. The Minogues became willing members of Stan Taylor's violent gang. They had a name for themselves, the Animals. And following the Russell Street bombing, they hid out in the Mallee town of Birchip. Police prepared to swoop and arrest the gang with extra motivation following the death of Constable Angela Taylor. After hovering near death for 25 days, the Melbourne policewoman who suffered horrific burns in the Russell Street bombing has died. Among the 1,000 attending were relatives, colleagues and friends there was the quiet respect for the parents and young brothers of Constable Angela Taylor. There was no way I wasn't going to go to the funeral, I can tell you right now. I don't care what it took. Oh, you go there because that's the support you have for, for mates, you know. It's that brotherhood which everyone criticises, but it's a bloody strong thing when you need it and when people look after each other, it's a bloody good thing. Why should such an atrocious act claim the life of one so young, so full of promise, and so keen. Angela Rose Taylor, you have left us in the prologue of your life, and you will remain forever an inspiration to this force and all that is good in life. development in Operation Russell was military in style and top secret. Bomb task force detectives left Melbourne last night in two helicopters. They set up headquarters at Sinanad, then raided two houses at Birchip. The sleepy town of Birchip in the Victorian Mallee 
woke up to the sound of a police raid in the early hours of May the 30th, 1986. Task force members had arrived in force to arrest Stan Taylor and the Minogue brothers, the animals, for murdering a police officer and trying to blow up their headquarters. Special Operation Group raided Taylor's house. Ken Williams and myself formally arrested him. And we said, where's Craig and Rodney? And he says, oh, look, I've got a phone number here. This is where they're at. First to face court this morning was 23-year-old Craig William Minogue. He and his 20-year-old brother were sleeping in this motel room in Campbell Street, Swan Hill, when police burst in just before 5.30. Craig Minogue stood in passively as the charges were read out, with his face down and his handcuffed hands clasped. After Taylor gave them up, it quickly became apparent that Stan the Man's strategy was to blame his apprentices for the Russell Street bombing. He was the one who drew them into a life of violent crime. But then he couldn't wait to throw them under the bus. We interviewed him for over 17 hours. And his demeanour was the broken man. He was very softly spoken. He had no element of aggression about him. Ostensibly, he wanted to unburden himself of his knowledge of the bombing and the boys, as he called. Uh, Taylor's story, in a nutshell, was, yes, I was there on the day of the bombing at Harris Avenue. I drove down, but I didn't want anything to do with it, so I left and I came home. Stan Taylor was 49 years old when he was arrested. He had spent half his life in jail and clearly didn't want to go back in a hurry. But in order to understand whose idea it was to bomb Russell Street, we need to go back to his time in Pentridge, where Ray Mooney encouraged Stan to write his life story. He wrote it, all this sort of basically in confidence with me. He'd write every night and give me what he'd written. I'd talk him through it, we'd go through it, I'd ask him further questions, asking to explain more. <laughs> Young Stan had his first encounter with the police at the age of nine, when he says they made him sign a statement of guilt over a break and enter. He wrote that his father picked him up from the police station. When they got home, his dad viciously assaulted him. He whipped me from the ankles to my neck with the ironing cord. I was cut everywhere and blood was all over the place. I remember my mum trying to stop him and pulling the cord from him. I know he then hit me with his fists, but I could not feel them. This was the first time I felt hate towards my father, not for the thrashing, but because he didn't try to understand. I also felt hate for police in general. It's, it's interesting, when I was in prison, everyone, and when I meant everyone, everyone who was sort of angry and wanted to have something to say, were always talking about one of these days I'm going to blow up Russell Street or I just can't wait till someone blows up Russell Street. It was one of those things that everyone talked about. It's like the great bookie robbery. It was always talked about before it happened. Uh, Russell Street was always talked about. Why? Russell Street was the symbol for the entire police force. It's quite well known now and admitted by police that on the fifth floor of Russell Street, they often held prisoners out the window with rope on their legs. They bragged about how they used to do it. Our robbery squad, come in here, boys, and OK, got nothing to say? All right, take him over to the window. And I'll tell you what, pretty certain everyone had a lot to say. Stan Taylor told Ray that it had happened to him too. This is a bloke who has been held out the fifth story window of Russell Street. Whenever I spoke to him, we never went further than that. He'd been held out. He didn't want to talk about what it meant to him. But I, you could see that he, it had just internalised. So there are antecedents in this story 
if you really analyse them, it's not that difficult to see and understand why he goes on to do what he does. Let's be clear, the Russell Street bombing was not just about revenge, it was an act of terror, Victoria's first terrorist attack, directed at police and civilians alike. And it could have been much worse if the gang had managed to drive the bomb car down into the police centre's underground car park. That's what they wanted to do. It could have brought the entire building down and killed hundreds of people. There was a guard on the gate, albeit an aged senior constable, but there was still a guard on the gate, and they realised they couldn't do that. But let's make no bones about trying to ameliorate responsibility here. Stanley Taylor said to those, to his boys, if I ever have cancer and I am in a wheelchair, I want you to put a suicide vest on me and wheel me into the bloody joint. Next. You go to see the trial and you see Stan in the court. Your reflections? Great actor. One of the world's greatest actors. When arrested in Birchip over the Russell Street bombing, Stan Taylor was living with Paul Hetzel and his wife, Julie. But Hetzel wasn't just Taylor's housemate. He was an active member of the animals in the lead up to the bombing. In 2016, Hetzel spoke to 60 Minutes about his time with the animals. So you actually participated in armed robberies with I did, yes. the Minogues and Stan Taylor yes. and Peter Reed. Tell me about those robberies. How violent did oh, they get? Oh, they were just extremely violent. Every Everyone, someone got bashed or kicked or something like that. You were more scared of Stan and the Minogues and Peter Reed than you were of the police, weren't you? Yes. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Hetzel struck a deal with the police when they arrested him in connection with the Russell Street bombing. He'd give evidence against his co-accused in return for being placed in protective custody. Why did Hetzel assist? Who knows? Uh, there is no honour among thieves. Hetzel was getting on in age. He's his burden. He's load. Hetzel told police that several months before the bombing, he travelled with Taylor and the animals to an abandoned gold mine in the country, where the gang raided a strong box packed with explosives. How much gelignite did you get away with? Oh, there was a heap of gelignite in the thing. I don't know, it was two or three boxes. Massive amounts. That's massive amounts, yeah. It was after the... The jolly night was, was stolen. Taylor brought the subject up. Well, why don't we bloody just uh, use this on, on the police? Let's load a car up and um, drive it under Russell Street. In his statement to police, Hetzel outed Taylor as the mastermind behind the bombing. This was a big deal, considering their close relationship in the 70s when they featured in a documentary inside Pentridge Prison. My name is Paul Hetzel. I'm serving a 22 and a half year sentence for armed robbery and attempted murder. Uh, my name is Stanley Brian Taylor and I'm serving 21 and a half years for robbery under arms. Well, I do most of the uh, electrical repairs. Hetzel told police that Taylor had the skills to make the bomb. And the day after the blast, he boasted of his success. He told us all about the bombing. He told us how they loaded the bomb car up and then after the bomb went off, you know, he said something about, oh, you f***ing beauty. The police had all they needed to go to trial. It was 
Very challenging in so much as at the time, the average homicide brief was perhaps 100, 200 pages. The Russell Street bombing brief was 2,000 pages. Um, 600 witness statements had been taken in relation to it. The trial began. Four men are charged with the bombing and the murder of Angela Taylor on Easter Thursday, 1986. A Crown witness earlier told the court that the eldest, 51-year-old Stan Taylor, had the knowledge to put the bomb together. That key witness, Paul Hetzel, also described how Taylor hated police and had always had a passion to blow up Russell Street. Asked if Taylor had ever killed a police officer, Hetzel replied, oh yes sir, Angela Taylor. Stan Taylor continued to sell the Minogue brothers down the river portraying himself as a bit player in the bombing. Stanley Taylor denied he'd stolen or even laid a finger on the bomb car. He also denied stealing the explosives for the bomb. Taylor continued, I've never been interested in explosives and I wasn't interested in this lot. You go to see the trial and you see Stan in the court. Yeah. Your reflections? Great actor. Great actor, one of the world's greatest actors. He's as, he was a De Niro. He was as good as any actor you've ever seen in your life. Last Wednesday, the jury retired to consider its verdicts. But the jury saw through the charade. Taylor was found guilty over the Russell Street bombing and the murder of Constable Angela Taylor. He was sentenced to life in jail with no prospect of release. Craig Minogue was also given life, but with a non-parole period of 28 years. His brother Rodney was acquitted on appeal and walked free. Peter Reid was also acquitted, but sentenced to 12 years jail for the attempted murder of a policeman during his arrest when he pumped two bullets into Detective Sergeant Mark Wiley. Having turned Queen's evidence in the trial, Paul Hetzel and his partner Julie headed straight into witness protection. But Hetzel was having dark thoughts about his former friends, the animals. One thing you don't want to be branded is a dog. No one trusts you, no one wants to be part of your friendship or anything. You taint it with it like I'm tainted now with it. In 1992, six years after the Russell Street bombing, Hetzel's world was turned upside down when his wife's 13-year-old granddaughter, Prue, was abducted from her Melbourne home. I absolutely adored her. I've got no children of my own, and she was like my surrogate daughter. Prue was never seen again. And Hetzel is convinced that she disappeared because he turned on Taylor and the animals. We make no accusations. 17 years later, another criminal with no connection to the Russell Street bombers confessed that he murdered Prue. It is indeed a very curious sequence of events. Next, the final insult for the victims and survivors. It's feared one of the men behind the 1986 bombing of the Russell Street Police Complex could be paroled within months. It's been over 30 years since the assault on police headquarters and the murder of Constable Angela Taylor. Yet one of the bombers continues to make headlines. In 1988, Craig Minogue bashed to death a fellow inmate with a pillowcase loaded with gym weights. But no extra time was added to the 29 years he got for the bombing. Since then, he sued the Victorian government, mostly concerning his treatment in prison. In 2016, Minogue completed his non-parole period. It's feared one of the men behind the 1986 bombing of the Russell Street Police Complex could be paroled within months. 
There's outrage and bewilderment Minot could soon be set free. The parole board urged to act cautiously. No one can be certain that his application will not proceed in the next few weeks. The Victorian government challenged Minogue's application. In fact, they changed the law to keep Minogue behind bars for the rest of his life. Craig Minogue will die in jail, and that's exactly what should happen. Do you think it's fair that someone who's paid their debt to society should be kept in there like Minogue is? I think it's disgraceful that they wait until he's ready to apply for release before they change the law. It really undermines the criminal system of justice when that's what you do, because it was all premised upon him being given a sentence with a release date. In 2018, Minogue challenged the law and took it all the way to the High Court. The High Court has ruled Russell Street bomber Craig Minogue could be eligible for parole, despite legislation designed to keep him locked up for life. The Andrews government immediately announced plans to amend the law as the opposition accused it of a monumental stuff-up. We will fix this issue and ensure that there is absolutely no way that people like Craig Minogue will get out on parole. Have you stuffed it up? It's not a matter of a stuff-up, it's a matter of a technicality. In the end, the redrawn law was upheld by the High Court, and now Craig Minogue will spend the rest of his life in jail. But sadly, while Minogue continues his headline-grabbing bid for freedom, others have suffered in silence. Detective Sergeant Mark Wiley, who was shot and nearly killed while arresting Peter Reid, took his own life in 2014 after a long battle with depression. You knew him as a student. What, what was your take on him? Mark Wiley was a terrific human being. Courageous, brave, probably one of the brightest students I had. Um, but he never got over what happened uh, in terms of the arrest of these people and being shot. There's a push to get him on the honour board with Angela Taylor as someone who lost their life as a result of their service. Well, I'd endorse that. There's a direct nexus between what happened and the end of his life, and that should be better recognised, in my view. Stan Taylor, the mastermind of the bombing, died of natural causes under police guard in hospital in 2016. He was 79 years old. How does it make you feel as a victim of this to hear the rationale that this was an act of war, that, that Taylor had been through H Division and boys' homes and had this pathological hatred for police, basically trying to suggest that the police had it coming. Yeah. <laughs> he's just a soft cock, mate, that's all he is. If he had any balls, he'd stand up and deal with it, wouldn't he? You know, like he'd confront the people if, they've, if he reckons he's been touched up in an interview room or whatever. Well, there's avenues of way you could deal with that, can't you? At the end of the day, he's just, he's just a dickhead. What a complete waste of a life, Ray. Yeah, I don't think he sees it that way somehow. I, I, see, I, I look at it like that also. But here's the bloke who blew up Russell Street. That gave him kudos that no one else in the world had. It's a big deal. It, it is a big deal. The Crims thought it was the best thing that ever happened. You ask any crim and they'll say, oh, terrible, shouldn't have done it, innocent people, blah, blah, blah. But deep down, they were proud that one of theirs had. That's the truth. I know it's sad, but it's the truth. So how do you react to it when you hear old crooks say today, well, the police had it coming? Bullshit. See, the police represent authority. The police represent the government. Police represent the community. More than ever before, our police personnel are just ordinary members of that community. 
Now, if you're going to attack them, you're going to have to attack everybody else because that's, that's what you're doing. Chris O'Connor is absolutely right. The bombing of police headquarters in Russell Street was not just an attack on the police. It was an assault on the state of Victoria. I have no sympathy for the likes of Stan Taylor and Craig Minogue. I reserve all that for the parents of Constable Angela Taylor, for the family of Sergeant Mark Wiley, for all those many people who were injured in the blast, and for those who came to their aid. Do you think you'll ever not think about Russell Street? No. Ever. Every 10 years, I get contacted. Um, you've invited me here. Uh, it's something that will never go away. I can always remember, uh, we were going with the kids down to cows and I can remember one of the kids running into a, a, a glass door. And, well, the noise just sent me through the roof. God. So those things trigger you. Uh, it's not something that uh, we'll ever leave. <laughs>